Welcome to Devon and Cornwall Microsoft Power BI User Group. We're welcoming Sam Fisher today. But before we get into the uh, session with Sam, let me just introduce to you some of the sessions that, have com that are coming up in the next few months. So we've got Sam, no session next week because we're, we're at SQL Bits, but if anyone wants to join us, I will put the form in the chat again. We've got Supercharging Excel um, with XMLA endpoints with Paul Martin the week after. Then we've got Henrik um, showing us all about VS Code and he's learning loads, which he's um, very happy to share with us. And um, they've just changed it because you used to be able to flip from one to the other. Um, and then after that, we've got Chaos to Clarity, Pattern Extraction with Melissa. Then we've got Jay from the Power BI Cat team showing us visual calculations. On the 23rd, there's no session because I'm in London after work. Um, and then um, we've got Psychology and Report Design by John Lenn, which is, oh, I've seen his session, it's absolutely brilliant. And then we have Shabnam Watson, who is, um, she's fantastic. I saw her give this presentation and it, it's really, really good. She, she just explains technical concepts so clearly. And then Marjolein is going to wow us with some um, JSON themes, which I'm really, really looking forward to because anything that helps my design um, is, is always good. And Dave is going to join us and look at bad reports and good reports. And then Tim, I don't know if you've been looking at uh, LinkedIn, but Tim is doing some amazing sessions on um, SharePoint and Power Platform and Power Automate. So his content's really good. Can't remember what I'm doing in June, but I've put keep free. Um, and then we've got Alex Powers, and then we've got 3DBI with Kenny, um, something else, and then Power BI development stages with Juliana um, using Primavera. So there's there's quite a few sessions coming up that I think you know should be of interest to all of us. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to um, hand over um, the session to our guest of honour, um, Sam, who is going to take us how to build a star schema with Power Query. So I will stop sharing, Sam, and ho hold it over to you. Questions, please put in the chat. And um, Sam's found a lot of the questions get answered with the presentation, but we will stop at opportune moments, but not, you know, not directly during the presentation, we'll, we'll stop at complete moments. So um, I'll stop sharing and hand it over to Sam. Perfect. Thanks, Sue. Um, all right. So um, this session, um, it's entitled How to Create a Star Schema Automatically with Power Query. So it should be an interesting one. And I'm looking forward to taking all of you through it. Um, all right. And now I just need my PowerPoint to be moving on. All right. There we go. Great. So um, first of all, to introduce myself, uh, my name's Sam Fisher. Uh, I'm a self-described Power BI Guru based out of uh, Melbourne, down in Australia. Um, during the day, uh, I work for a small consultancy called Revenite, where I'm a principal consultant. We work with Power BI, Fabric, Databricks, a lot of the main um, data analytics tools that are out in the market these days. Um, within my role, um, I lead a, a Power BI practice where we've got over a dozen Power BI developers. Um, and I've been involved in many different client projects uh, working uh, with that team as well. Um, and when I'm not working throughout the day, um, I also like to post um, some of the things that I learn about Power BI um, in little tutorials and blogs that I have on my blog, apexinsights.net. So please feel free to check that out as well. Um, I'll also point out um, for clarity, I sometimes get confused for another Sam Fisher, who's also from Australia, who also looks quite similar to me. Um, I sometimes get um, I sometimes get Facebook messages from me from, from people thinking that I'm this particular pop star. So um, if anyone was coming to this session expecting uh, this other more famous Sam Fisher, sorry to disappoint you, but I'm sure that there'll still be something interesting for you either way. Um, great. So what we're going to cover in this session, we're going to go through a little bit about flat files and when you might be dealing with flat files uh, within your work with Power BI. Um, and then we're going to go through the differences between a flat file and modeling things as a star schema. And a bit of a spoiler <laughs> alert if you didn't know, but star schema is usually the better way to model things. Um, so once we go through those comparisons, we'll work out how we can actually convert 
um, any data that you've got coming in that is in the form of a flat file into a SAR schema. And we've got a few approaches that we can do that. We can either do that manually with what I would call a bit of a staged queries approach, um, but there's also another approach that we can use where we can uh, do all this automatically with a more metadata driven approach. So I'll walk you through that as well. All right, um, and I've also got some assumptions for yourselves as audience members coming into this talk. So I'll first of all assume that you're all familiar with Power BI Desktop and Power Query, and I'm sure everyone in this uh, this session would be. Um, I'm going to assume that you're fitting into one of these three buckets, being a beginner, intermediate, or advanced Power Query user. Um, it sounds kind of trivial saying saying that, but I put that in there as a bit of a reminder um, to clarify within this talk across the different topics, there is something for everyone, whether you're just starting out in Power Query or you're an advanced user who um, likes to write out custom functions and really dig into the M code. So there's something for everyone. Bear in mind though, that if you're a beginner, you may find that towards the end, things start to get a bit hairy for you and that's okay. Um, um, bear in mind that that's probably more for the advanced users. And for the advanced users, there are some basics at the start. So just um, if it's stuff you've heard before, Feel free to um, feel free to take it easy while we go through that for everyone else. Um, other assumptions, I'll assume that you've heard of, you may have heard of this term star schema, but it's not essential for this talk. Again, we'll kind of go through the very basics. Um, I'll assume that you can handle a demo heavy session because most of the talk uh, today is demos. And I'll assume that when it comes to rating the session, you would rate it 10 out of 10. Cool. All right, so first of all, flat files. So um, what are flat files and when might you be dealing with them? So when we talk about a flat file, what the main thing that we're concerned with is just basically a single table of data. You're not talking about um, a data model as such. You're just talking about a single file that has all your data in columns and rows, um, usually in like a spreadsheet or something like that kind of form. Now, in Power BI, the most ideal scenario and really our expectation going in, in an ideal world, is that we would have all our data um, from all of our different source systems coming into a central data warehouse or a lake house, and then we could just connect straight up to that, um, that centralized repo as a single source of truth and just visualize insights over the top of that. That's our expectation and that's the ideal world, but uh, reality is often a lot more complicated because um, in order to bring everything into a warehouse, there's a lot of effort involved in making sure everything's conformed. Um, and what often happens is within a business context, it's easier to have you know, maybe your central data sets within a data warehouse, but a lot of other data sets you may still want to visualize that aren't stored within the warehouse. So one example might be business users who are storing data just in flat Excel spreadsheets um, that you might need to visualize. You may have your data coming from um, an external third party vendor. You may have your business data stored with them. And for one reason or another, they may not make you know, a direct database connection readily available to you. you know, sometimes that's to protect their IP. Sometimes that's because they've got multiple customers that they're servicing and they don't want to inadvertently expose data from other customers. So what they'll often do is they might provide that um, that data to you in a different forms. So they might give you, say, a front end interface to build your own queries off the back of that, export, like say, CSV files that you can use to access your data. Or it might even be that they give you an API interface, um, whether from external vendors or from the wider internet. Um, that's a common way that you may get your data out. And that may come in, uh, it may come in CSVs, it may come in JSON format. Um, usually in JSON format, it's a it's a um, it's a document structure. It may not be perfectly flat traditionally, but it's all in the one place. Um, so whether your data is coming from Excel, CSV, JSON, any of these other forms, it's not necessarily going to be built in a in a model as such. So that on the surface may make it difficult, but fortunately, this is where we have Power Query to help us out. So with Power Query, we can take those flat files, we can convert them into um, a data model that makes it easier to visualize in Power BI. And then we can report off of that. So um, we've got that tool at our disposal to help us um, in the event that we don't have things modeled in a data warehouse already. All right, cool. So with that, let's get into our demos. So I'll just bring up the first demo here. 
And in this first demo file, I'm just going to take you through what you might expect if you're looking at a flat file, just to make things a bit more familiar. So um, I've already got a flat file loaded up into this Power BI desktop file. And if I look at the model view, it's the load for me. Um, so if I look at the model view, there's nothing special about this. I've got a single table loaded into my model, which is what you can see on the data view on the right hand side. And in fact, let's look at the table view just to get a sense of what we're looking at here. You can see my computer's still waking up this morning, at least morning for me. Um, but in any case, as this loads up, what we've loaded into um, this demo file is I've got a flat table that has sales transactions. Um, these sales transactions come from Contoso, which is a fictional retail organization often using the training data sets from Microsoft. Um, and each, uh, each record here describes a line item in a sales transaction over a couple of years um, worth of time. So you can see there's a number of different columns that are represented here, and all these, all these columns describe that sales transaction. So you can see there's a unique sales key <clears throat> um, here. And you can also see down the bottom here that we've got across this whole table, that 1.5 million um, sales transaction records here. So it's you know quite a bit of data here. You can see that we've got a, a date key. So that tells us the date of the transaction. We've got a number of different columns to describe um, what we could build out as measures in our data set. So we've got unit cost, unit price, return amount, discount amount, sales amount. And then we've got a number of different attributes. So just to give you a quick overview of what we've got in here, for each sales transaction, we've got information about um, how the purchase was made. You know, was it made in a brick and mortar store? Was it made in a um, buyer catalog or a reseller or an online purchase? Where it was made, uh, where the purchase was made in a brick and mortar store, we can see the store name. Um, and we can see a number of attributes about the stores as well. So there's a few things like employee count, selling area size, but then also, um, you know, where is it based? Based in the United States, for example. Um, we've also got information about promotions. So was there a promotion applied when that sales transaction was made? Now, a lot of these, there's going to be no discount applied, but there's a number of different promotions that took place over, um, over that period as well. And then where there is a promotion, we can see what the percentage of the discount is as well. Um, so the other attributes we've got, we've got product names, uh, product descriptions, who was a manufacturer, you know, was it um, manufactured by Contoso or a third party organization? And then we can see product categories and subcategories. Um, and then finally, some attributes around the, the sales date. So we can see the month name, the day of the week, the year, and then these are the ones around the day of month. So what you can see here is when we've got things structured as a flat file, there's a lot of attributes here, um, and you've got to scroll across to try and get an intuition about things. You can see that there's a lot of repeated values in here as well. But one of the challenging things is, again, conceptually, it can be hard to understand what's going on here a little bit. So say, for example, on the right-hand side, when I'm looking at my data pane, um, I can see that within this table, I've got a number of different fields, but they're not necessarily conceptually grouped in a way that's easy for me to um, report off of. So, so for example, I've got my promotion start date, which in a list is right next to my quarter of year, which isn't really related to promotions, more related to the sales date. And that's right next to my uh, region country name, which is more about the geographies. So, you know, it's not exactly straightforward as far as um, how things are structured. But that's OK, because we can still build out some insights here. And we'll just go through a quick drag and drop to show you how we can build some insights to see some of the other challenges we might face. So starting out, let's maybe um, see how our sales um, are going over time. So if we start with, let's say, our date key, we'll drag that onto the canvas. And then we can visualize that as, um, let's say we visualize that as a, um, as a stacked area chart. Um, but we also need to bring in a measure. So for a measure, I'm just going to use an implicit measure for the purpose of this demo. Let's bring in our sales amount. There we go. So we can see that our sales tend to vary over time. 
um, unsurprisingly. Um, we can see that starting from January 2022, we had sales of around 6 million um, across the whole um, international organization. Um, sales started to ramp up uh, probably around uh, Sam, you've just muted yourself or you've done it. Yeah, just noticed that. That was a bit strange. I'm not sure what yeah, happened there. It was, quick, okay. it was very quick, so no, nothing rushed. Yeah, all good. Um, yeah, so we've had the sales pick up in February, um, drop back down in March, but then it's consistently ramped up over time. Um, and that's pretty consistent with retail seasonality, um, where people are all shopped out after Christmas in January, same for the following January. And there's, the, of course, the ramp up, up towards Christmas as well. So we can see some insights. You know, we only had to drag a few fields across to do that. Um, now let's say that with these sales, we want to slice these um, by different attributes. So let's say we want to slice this by, let's say by store. So what I can do is I can find my store name field. I can drag that onto the slice onto the canvas, convert that to a slicer. Here we go. So this is a list of all the stores that we have, uh, brick and mortar stores for Contoso. So we can see what the sales are like um, in the Albany store. We can see that once the engine runs, we can see that we've got this seasonality going here. We can see how it's going to Amsterdam as well. So we can do some analysis off of this if we want as well. Um, we can also bring in, say, products and do some similar analysis there. We might want to see um, how our sales vary by product. So I've got that as a table, I'll just make that as a slicer as well. And here we go. So I can see for all these different products, these ones at the top of the list are all digital cameras, but I can see um, for our M300 Azure colored camera, I can see what the sales are over time. I can see what they are for this black one, or even this M200 silver. So for those of you that are paying close attention, you may have noticed that when I selected this M200 silver camera, while it did change the visual here, it also changed the store slicer here. So I'll untick it again. You can see this store slicer change here, and that's because the Albany store actually disappeared when I selected the M200 silver. So just to work out what's going on, what I can do is I can select the Albany store again. Then I can see that silver camera actually disappeared from the product slicer. And that might look a bit strange if you're not sure what's going on here. But this is one of the symptoms that you can get when you're working with a flat file. So what's actually happening is that's telling us that there are no sales that occurred for the Albany store and for that M200 silver camera. So that may be because they don't stock that product. That may be because there's been no sales and it's just sat on the shelf for a couple of years. It could be for a number of different reasons. But what can often happen when you have this behavior in your report pages, you may find um, business users may get confused by that. They may start lodging support tickets, say, hey, this report's broken. And this challenge becomes even worse when you've got, you know, five or six or more slices or different filters on on the page because as a business user it can be hard to work out why things aren't behaving the way that you would expect so that's one of the challenges you can face out of the box with a flat file there are, are ways on the report page canvas to address this so you can uh, edit the interactions to make the slices not talk to one another you can apply measure based filters um, but that's somewhat manual you'd have to do that for every single report page and at the end of the day there's there's better ways to do things so that's where a flat file comes in. So I'll just bring up my next uh, demo file and we can have a look through that as well as a point of contrast. All right. All right, so I'll just jump to the model view of this second demo file and we can see the loaded data for this, how this is structured. I always love it when someone starts with a Power BI report with a model view. 
it's always my yeah my my first go-to oh uh, yeah I, I prefer it as well because it tends mm. to um it tends to help you build your intuition much quicker yeah. than anything else yeah yeah Cool. So for this model, um, we've got things structured a little differently where we've now got multiple tables loaded into the data set. So you can see here, for those who aren't familiar with it, this is what's called a star schema. Um, and we've got two different, I guess, flavors of tables. We've got what I would call a fact table, which you can think of as the any business events or transactions that have happened um, that you're analyzing. And then you've also got the dimension tables around it. So the dimension tables are attributes that describe the facts. So they're kind of like your, your who, what, where, why, and how. So for example, for each of our sales, we've got our calendar dimension, which describes the when. We've got our store dimension, which describes the, the where. We've got our product dimension, which describes the, the what, what was sold. Um, we've got the promotion, which you could consider even the why of what, what prompted the sale, perhaps. And then the channel, which is how the sale was made. You know, was it made online or in a brick and mortar store? Um, and the reason why this is called a star scheme is because with the fact table in the middle and all the dimensions around the outside, um, they all join to the, f the dimensions all join to the fact in a one to many relationship. And in the more crow's feet notation, it tends to look more like an actual star and it's laid out this way so that's why it's called a star schema so with these six tables we've got these different six tables in the in the data view and we can actually explore what that looks like in the tables so in fact let's start with our fact sales table so so as this is loading up you'll be able to see that there's a number of different columns that are quite familiar from our uh, flat table. So there's already a sales key that we had um, in the other table. Um, there's a number of different measure columns that we had as well. So we've got unit cost, unit price, return amount, sales amount. They're all pretty familiar to us already. Um, but then the only other columns that we've got in this fact sales table are these different keys. And these relate to the different um, other tables in the model. So we've got a date key, um, just like we had in the existing model, but we've also got a channel key, a store key, a product key, a promotion key. So this is how we relate to the other tables within the model. So um, the other thing to note is with the fact sales table, we've still got our 1.5 million sales transactions in this table. It's just that this is more skinnier to, of a, a is more of a skinnier table now. There's not as many columns because all the attributes that we had in the other columns they're now contained in these separate tables here. So for example, if I look at uh, say my store dimension table, you can see that it's got all my store names, um, the continent, country, um, and then it's got the, the store key as a primary key here. And then we could see for the other tables, we can see similarly. So let's say for the date dimension, I've got one unique record for each date. Um, and then I've got fields for the month name, the day name, et cetera. So this is already addressing one of the challenges that we had with a flat file, which is where it's it's got things structured in a more conceptually easy way to understand. So you can see that all my attributes, all of my attributes relating to store are sitting in the store table. All my attributes relating to dimension um, relating to calendar are sitting in the calendar dimension. And that's going to make it easier to drag and drop things. So we can also go through the similar analysis to before, where if we want to look at sales by date, we can just drag in from the calendar dimension. We can drag in our date key. Convert that to an area chart. And while that's running, I can also bring in the sales amount like before. Yeah. So we've got our same, we've got our same sales data as previously. Um, just, just in the interests of things taking a bit, little bit of time to load, I'll just bring up 
that same data as we had with the same slices. So we've got our store name and our product name slicer, just like we had with the flat file. What we'll find now is with this uh, star schema structure, if I select the Albany store and slice on that, what we'll find is we still get this visual slice, but we'd find that the slicer for the product name, that's not affected by this store name here. And similarly, um, if I were to select M200 silver, this isn't going to affect the store name slicer. What it will do though, is when I've selected that, it's actually going to make this visual blank. So how you should interpret that is again, that there's no sales listed there. Um, this admittedly can cause some confusion for end users as well, but this is a bit easier to manage because it doesn't necessarily look like, you know, the data, it's not showing um, strange behavior in the slices. And there are tricks around this. You can set your measures, uh, you can set your measures to return values of zero. Where this is the case, you can even do tricks like having background messages come up to say, oh, no sales have been returned. There's a few ways around this, but typically um, your star schema is usually better to handle these scenarios. As for why, as for why the slices aren't impacted here like they were for the flat file, this actually comes down to how the model is structured. So back in the model view, if I'm selecting, um, if I'm selecting a store in my uh, store name slicer, what's actually happening is I'm creating a filter on the store name on on the store dimension table, and that filter is propagating down through this dimension, following this little arrow, for the filtering direction, and that filters the fact sales table down to just those sales for that Albany store. But that filter doesn't pass to any of the other tables because all the filtering directions point towards the fact. It's not pointing back up away from it. So that's why my product dimension or my product slicer didn't have any filtering applied. But then similarly, once I apply a product filter at the same time, it's going to filter out um, any of the sales that occurred for uh, any other products. And that's where we get the blanks there because there's no rows returned once we apply those two competing filters. So that comes down to how the model structured there as well. Now, one final thing um, I'll point out as well as far as why um, flat files are usually better to avoid and you're better off going with a star schema, that comes down to the um, that comes down to the uh, size of the model once once it's uh, compressed in Power BI. So what I'm going to quickly do is for my flat file, I'm going to open up DAX Studio, which is a extension that's very useful. Um, if you haven't been using DAX Studio, I would highly recommend using that. And what it's going to allow us to do once it's loading up on my other screen is it's going to allow us to actually see what is the size of the model once it's actually loaded up, um, loaded into Power BI Desktop. And what we seem to be having is some difficulties here. I'm not sure why my laptop's so unhappy this morning, but as an alternative. It needs a coffee. It's been. Yeah, there. I think it does. <laughs> But Funny enough, quite a few of my users, they like to have the um, the slices affect the other slices. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's like a, a business customer choice, isn't it? It's, it's depending mm. on, you know, how you use it. Yeah, exactly. It is, it is a bit of dealer's choice. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it, again, it does come down to how your business users are used to interacting with things. They may be mm -hmm. perfectly fine with what the flat file does there. Yeah. Um, but, that's okay. but that's okay. Even without... Um, DAX Studio, all we can do is we can even just look at the size of the um, of the files here. So for our flat file, um, that model, which we knew had uh, 150, oh, sorry, 1.5 million sales transactions, that takes up about 37 meg on disk. But then the star schema file, that actually only takes up 30 meg. On, on disk. So it's the same 1.5 million sales transactions, but it takes up less space overall. And in fact, when it's loaded in Power BI and the Vertipak engine spins up, the star scheme actually compresses even more. Mm. So you've got the same number of sales transactions. And in fact, you have more columns because you've also got all these keys floating around here, but it actually takes up less space. And with it taking up less space, there's less, uh, there's less iterations or less um, processing that your measures need to do um, across the data set to be able to work out the calculation. So it tends to perform better overall 
as well. So that's another important thing around structuring things as a star schema. Um, OK, so for all this talk of star schemas, that's all great if you've got things structured as a star schema. But if you have all your data in a flat file, how do you actually how do you actually get it into a star schema? So that's what we can go through in our next demo. So um, I'm just going to bring up uh, um, I'm just going to bring up my next demo file where I've got things loaded up in Power Query, where we're going to build out we're going to build out that star schema here. So what I've already got loaded, I've already got uh, my flat file loaded up um, into Power Query. And for the purposes of this demo, I've just filtered it to the first 1,000 rows, just to make things a little snappier. And hopefully that'll still be the case, even with my computer needing a bit of coffee this morning. Um, but um, what we're going to do is you can see that we've got um, multiple different uh, levels of queries or different groups. So we've got source queries, staging queries, and loading queries. And we're going to populate these as we go. So starting out with our initial flat file, which we're sourcing from, you know, in this case, a CSV file, what we're going to do is we're going to create our first staging query. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reference this query. And it's important that I don't duplicate this one, but I want to reference this one so that I'm inheriting all the logic from the previous steps. So I'll drag this one into our staging queries. And to build this out, the first table in my model that I'm going to build, I'm going to build out one of my dimension tables. And I'll build out all my dimensions before I build the fact. So I'll start with, um, let's say, dim calendar. I'll call that dim calendar staging. And then from here, what I'm going to do to build out my calendar dimension is all I need to do is just select the fields that are relevant to relevant to dates. So I'm going to start with this date key that's uh, here. Um, I can scroll all the way across to find my other columns, which here we've got the month name, day of week name, year, quarter, month of year, and day of month. So these are all my columns I need in my date dimension. And to build out my date dimension, I need a unique combination of all these, or at least one record per date. So to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to transform at the top and I'm going to select group by. So the group by transform will give me that and it will build out uh, one record per date. And then I can also add an aggregation here. So I could add, add the count rows. That's not super helpful for me, but one thing that is going to be helpful for me is an all rows aggregation and I'll add that in and then I'll show you why we've got that in there. I'll click OK. And then when I group the rows, what that's doing is that's returning one unique record per date here. And then when I select the um, nested table here under the all rows, what that's doing is that's storing all the sales transactions and all the attributes for all the sales that occurred on, in this case, the 11th of April here. So you can see that there was six different sales transactions here. And same goes for the next one in this list, the 23rd. We've got all the sales transactions for those. So we've grouped these up and we've got most of what we need for our calendar dimension. So what I'm going to do is now I'm going to reference this um, a couple of times because what we're going to do is we're pretty much ready to load our calendar dimension. But we need to um, we need to keep going with building out our other dimensions as well. So the first thing that we can do is I'm going to reference this again. And I can bring this into my loading queries. I'm going to load this as dim calendar, so I don't need to call that staging anymore. And at this stage, all I need to do is just remove this all rows here. So I can go home and I can go remove columns. Yeah, perfect. All right, so this is our calendar dimension and this is ready to load if we want. So the next thing that we need to do is um, we need to work with that all rows that we just got rid of in that next loaded one. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reference this as a second staging query. And what we can do is we can build this out to build, say, our product dimension here. OK, so if we want to build out our product dimension next, all we, what we need to do is we don't actually need these uh, date columns anymore because we've already um, kind of forked off these queries into two um, and we've got all those attributes in our calendar dimension. So what we can do is from all rows, we can right click and remove other columns. So we're just going to keep the all rows here. And from here, we can re-expand that because that's pretty much going to restore us back to our main flat table. Um, but what I am going to do is I'm going to keep my date key here because we need that um, to relate the calendar to the eventual fact table. But I can actually untick all these attributes related to date. So I'm going to do that. I'll click OK. That'll re-expand things for me. But now at this point, I'm now down to, I think I had 38 columns previously. I'm now down to 32 columns once I've shed off those uh, calendar dimension attributes. Um, so if I want to build out my product dimension next, what I can do is just like before, I can bring in all the attributes related to products. So I've got my product category, subcategory, and then scrolling all the way back, all the way to product name. You know, select all those and then I'm going to do the same as before where I'm going to group by those. So we can group by those but then we've got an extra step that we need to do this time as well that's important to go through so call this all rows again. And we've got everything grouped up into all of our unique product names here. We've got all the sales for each of the products stored in this in this nested table as well. Now, if we were doing things like the calendar dimension, we'd be able to just um, build out our product dimension from here. But there's one final thing that we need to do, and this is where we need to make sure that we've got um, a unique, consistent uh, key between the product dimension and the sales table. So now we could assume that the product name could act as a unique key, but it's not necessarily a safe assumption, especially because we've got multiple manufacturers and there's nothing stopping two manufacturers from having the exact same uh, product name for their products. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a surrogate key that's going to act as the um, new unique key for our products. So I can go add column, I can create an index column and that's just created my um, primary key right there. And I'm going to relabel that as product ID. So now I can use that as my key here. So just like before, what I can do is I can uh, I can reference this guy, build out my products dimension, move it into the staging queries. Name that as dim products. And then again, all I need to do here for this one is to remove the all rows. I'll just remove that. That's ready to go. Um, and then if I want to keep doing this for all five of my dimensions, I'm not necessarily going to go through this for all of them. Um, but what I would do is I would reference this here build out my third one and keep going. Um, but in this case, what I'll need to make sure that I'm doing is to make sure that um, I'm removing all those attributes, but I'm keeping that key. Um, because when I keep that key, that's going to become a foreign key when I bring it back into the fact table. So what I might do is I'll bring up, um, I'll bring up an example once that's fully built, it, built out so we don't have to go through each of those dimensions one by one. So you can see here in this file, we've got our same flat table, but we've got things built out where we've got multiple staging tables. We've got our dim products. It's going to have our index here. And then um, we do the same approach for all of our other dimensions where 
um, say in building out our promotion. Um, we've got all our DIM products. We're removing the other columns. And in this case, we're just keeping the product ID as well. And then when we re-expand at this point, we're going to have product ID now as a, as a foreign key in there. Yeah, so maybe that's not a way for that to load. But in any case, we can go through that same pattern for each of the dimensions that we want to build where we're grouping and then re-expanding, grouping and re-expanding, kind of like an accordion there. Um, and then finally, once we've built out all of our dimensions, we'd have our fact table here. And all we need to really do at that point is to, we'd be starting with our final dimension here as a staging table. We just need to remove all the other columns and then expand out to just bring us to this grain where we've got um, our sales key, date key, all our measures that relate to the fact, and then our IDs that we've created along the way. So um, that's pretty much how we can how we can take that flat file and build it out into a star schema. But as, as you can see, it is quite involved. There's a bit of stuff here. So um, just to summarize as well, what I might do is I'll jump back to the PowerPoint and I'll just summarize that technique with this diagram of how it works. So again, we've got our kind of three layers of source staging and loading, which conceptually kind of maps to a um, medallion architecture. Uh, um, we're starting with our flat table that we're bringing in um, and we're creating our first staging table where that's based around our first dimension. To build out that first dimension, we're grouping up on all those attributes um, and then we're adding in an all rows if we need it. And then we're splitting off into two, um, two other queries. So we're splitting off into our loaded dimension and then we're just getting rid of the all rows that we've generated here. And then for our next one, we're bringing in a dimension two as a staging. We're getting rid of all the attributes except for the all rows and then any keys we might have created as we go. We re-expand back, back to the original table grain and then we regroup it down to the next dimension. So we do the same thing where we split off into dimension two. We can do that for any number of dimensions that we have um, conceptually within the flat table. And then finally, for our fact table, um, to build that out, we just need to re-expand the final one and then load that final fact there. So that should have us covered as, um, as that general approach. Um, one thing that I'll point out as well, just I can see there's some questions in the chat as well that I can speak to now. So this approach admittedly is only going to have you covered for um, values that are stored within the flat table. So if you've got a business that say doesn't operate on weekends, your dimension table you're creating with this method, that's not necessarily going to have any of the weekend values um, contained within the date dimension or the calendar dimension. And that's usually not best practice, um, more because when you're building out, say, time intelligence measures in DAX, you would need a dimension table with a complete list of dates, and that's not going to have you covered here. So that's just a bit of a caveat to bear in mind as well. If you've also got products that aren't sold, then they're not going to be tracked here as well. So that's, again, where um, this will have you covered to a certain extent, but then there's other techniques you want to apply on the top of that um, as you go as well um, if you're building things out. But this at least has you covered for initial flat table. Um, I think, um, Sue, there was another question around the efficiency of things. Yeah, so, so for me, I always think uh, it was quite a revelation for me when I realised that, that Power Query reads from the bottom up. So when it reads the queries, it starts with the last one and then reads up. So I was just trying mm. to think of the flow going from the fact table up and the dimension table up and then using group by an indexing because <coughs> they <coughs> excuse me they can be quite heavy computationally mm. I think you know yeah. so yeah yeah no you're absolutely right so the other thing that I'll point out as well is that this technique it's not designed for you know huge performance yeah. like as in <laughs> if you're dealing with a flat table with you know tens of millions of records you're going to be waiting quite a while and yeah. I wouldn't be recommending this approach as well. And that that's 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 pretty tip that's fairly typical of even what Microsoft recommends within Fabric as well, where it's like for um smaller scale or low code, no code situations, power query is your friend. But then if yeah. you're making things at a higher scale, you want to be using things like Data Factory or um or Spark notebooks, for example. So that's that's another limitation as well that I'll admit. This isn't going to have you covered for everything for that performance reason. 
Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's a good question. Um, in any case, though, I, um, road testing this, I think um, if you had the full 1.5 million records when I've ran this, when my computer has had this coffee, <laughs> um, it only takes a couple of minutes to run. Um, so if you set all these things up, it's, it's relatively OK. Um, if you're doing a, a refresh and you don't want to have and you don't have the luxury of pushing things up otherwise. Um, but one thing, another thing I'll point out with this technique is it is quite manual to go through and create each of these dimensions one by one. So there's a bit of work involved there. So I always like to think, you know, is there a better way of doing things? Of course, your Spark approach is one way to do things. But one one approach that I explored was how could you automate Power Query? And this is where we can go through our final demo for today. So I'm now going to bring up one more Power Query instance where we've got our same flat table loaded. I've called this one metadata driven star schema builder. And this is because we're going to be doing things with a more metadata driven approach. So for this approach, um, all we need besides our um, flat table data, instead of manually going through and defining all those steps one by one, the only things that we need are um, this model schema table and then the function that we're going to use to um, combine the two. So in this model schema file, what we've got is we've got one record per, um, per column that sits within the flat table. So you can see we've got sales key, date key, unit cost. Then we've got some descriptive attributes for how we would want to model this in the star schema. So we can see that our unit costs, that lies within the sales fact table. We can see the store name lies in the store dimension table and the same for the rest of these columns here. There's one final column that we have, which is a flag to tell us if any of the keys that we've got here um, can be used as primary keys, as already existing fields. So in this case, we can use our date key as an existing primary field, uh, primary key. So with that, um, we've pretty much got everything that we need um, to build out our star schema. So what we can do is I've built out this function that allows us to ingest the flat table source. So let's select the flat table. And it also ingests the uh, model schema as our metadata. All I need to do is just click invoke on that function. And this has generated our output for us right here. So the output of that function, it has one record per entity within the flat table, or sorry, within the star schema. And then within the all rows here, this actually has the tables that we need to load into our model. So if I look at, say, the calendar dimension, I've got one record per date here. If I look at, say, the channel dimension, this is a fairly small dimension. Um, but it's only got these uh, reseller store values here as well. And it's got my keys here that I've generated as well. And even looking at our, our sales fact table, we can see we've got a sales key, all of our, our um, all of our columns that we can use to create measures within our model, and then all those IDs that we had to go and manually generate um, in that previous uh, um, stage queries approach. So if we want to load this into our model, instead of going through all that manual work of defining all those stage queries as we go, um, we can just right click and we can go add as new query. And that's going to generate our sales fact as something that we can load into our model here as well. So we can do the same for all the other functions there, um, all the other all the other tables there as well. So this is a lot easier than going through and manually defining those. And it means that if we've if we've made this classified where particular um, tables or columns should be, um, you know, maybe we accidentally put um, a calendar attribute in, maybe left it in the fact table. All we have to do is update this model schema table and that'll flow through. Makes things I, a lot can easier. I see the, yeah, the background. Can I see the query and the advanced query mm. for the function? Did I miss that? <coughs> yeah, well, it's actually coming up right next. So ah, that's perfect. Sorry, so, sorry, sorry, Sam. You said no, that. No, no, no. That's a, okay. No, no, that's okay. So I was like, where's um, that come from? I've missed that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the advanced editor with the M code is quite involved here, right? So you can see there's a lot of stuff involved. What, I, what I've actually got is these two explainer um, functions, oh, sorry, these two explainer queries, which set through the logic that we've, that I've got to find in here. So instead of trying to interpret all that M code, 
we can actually go through this and explore it to understand what's going on. Sorry, so, I'll be, I'll be uh, quiet. No, 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 that's okay. Curiosity is uh, the curiosity is good. Um, okay, so um, within actually, I'll go back. I'll go back to that M code because within that we've got a few layers to this. So um, we've got some nested functions here, which we effectively use to work out the logic for our like staging tables. So our dimensions and our facts and doing the grouping, the re-expanding. So that's what all this covers. And then we also need to apply that uh, recursively across all of our um, all of our dimensions. So there's a little loop that's been incorporated here where we actually have a recursive function that reapplies the logic that's above there as well. Again, if this is unfamiliar territory for you, that's OK. This is more for the advanced users here. Um, once, once this logic at the top builds out all those um, builds out all those staging tables, then we can build out the full star schema here, which I'll go through here as well now. So for the for building out all of our dimensions, the logic goes something like this. So for a given dimension, we start out with working out what dimension we want to apply this to. In this case, we can start with our calendar dimension. Then we need to pick up a few different things. We need to pick up from the model schema table what are all the fields that relate to that particular dimension? So we have filtered that down here to stab those records. And then we just need to um, pull the list of all the column names within there because we're going to use that later on. And then we've got a few um, other steps. So the next steps we have is are around identifying our existing primary key if we have it. So um, we can again filter that, um, that previous query step down to any instances where we have an existing primary key for the calendar dimension we have the date key so we can use that we just need to extract out the name for that because we're going to again use that and then i've got a bit of a data quality check so this is just to make sure that things are structured in a way that's compatible with how we need to build things out because if we're if we're saying that there should be a primary key in the table the whole point of a primary key is there should only be one so we just need to check that based on what we've defined in the model schema, that there is only one primary key. So we're just doing a row count to verify that. Um, in this case, the check's passed. But if that wasn't the case, then we come up with an error that would tell us exactly what the problem is, which is that there's multiple columns flagged for that dimension. So this is a good error checking technique in general. Um, um, it kind of follows a lot of data ops thinking and approaches to catch errors um, knowingly. Um, these kinds of approaches I've also got some blogs about um, on my um, blog apexinsights.net. So feel free to check that out if you want to use these kinds of techniques. But in any case, that's um, around identifying our primary keys. Once we've done that, we can then um, go through that step of grouping on our dimensions. So this step, what we've done is we've grouped on the dimension column names that we identified earlier. So we've got our date key, month name, date, week name. And we've added in this all rows here, just like we did in the manual approach. Now we need to go through another check, which is to verify that because we've um, said that the primary key is the date key, we just need to actually validate that in the actual data set. Because one thing that you can find, um, I found this especially when, when modifying some of the dummy data here to give it more relevant dates, is especially when you're dealing with leap years, you can have things like non-unique values here for your date keys. So um, you do need to make sure that you know, you've got um, the 11th of April only has the unique combination of these values here. Now, it's usually not as much of a problem for date fields, but it can be for other attributes as well. So um, it's just important to make sure that um, existing primary key is indeed unique. So that's what this check is all about. And then, of course, gives you a warning if that's not the case. And then what we need to do is if it's relevant to this particular query and we don't have an existing primary key, we would need to add uh, add a surrogate key, just like we did with the index previously. We don't need to do that um, for the uh, for the calendar dimension, fortunately. Um, so this that step just gets skipped here. Um, but once we've done that, and we've built out our keys. Um, we can now re-expand back to the other grain. To do that, we just need to make sure that we've got a list of all the other columns that we want to re-expand. And 
we can apply that re-expand, just an expand table column function um, on one of the previous steps. But what you will find is that if I'm looking at, say, my sales key here, and in fact, looking at a lot of the other columns that we've restored, you can see that there's no longer a, a type applied to these columns here. So it's actually stripped off the types and it hasn't kept those um, as we've gone through it. So um, we need to make sure that we restore those so we get back to where we started. So the final few steps around checking in the actual metadata of the flat table, what were all the data types for all the columns that we had? So you can see that the sales key is an integer, for example, date key is a date. And we need to make sure that we apply these same um, data types when we um, when we re-expand things. So I've got this transformation step. Um, this is quite involved but um, it effectively stitches together those data types back to what they were. So you can see the sales key now has um, the data types added, return amounts, um, the decimal as well. So that's how this works for set a calendar dimension. Just quickly as well, if we wanted to do this against uh, say a product dimension, I can just change this to product. So when we loop over our products, this is now going to pull the attributes for products. I'm going to pull those names here. For the primary key, we don't have a primary key for um, product name. So it's going to look for one and it's going to say, oh, look, we actually don't have an existing primary key. And then um, it's going to just inherently pass that check of not having more than one primary key. That makes things easier. And then for these next steps, um, again, we're grouping on the dimension. We're checking the uniqueness of the existing primary key. In this case, there is no existing primary key, so we just skip this check. And then in this case, because there isn't an existing primary key, we need to make sure that we're adding in that index there. So if we scroll across, we can see that we've got our product ID. Um, and then by adding in our product ID, if we go through all the re-expand steps, We've got all of our existing columns back in that flat table, but we've got our product ID that's been added on here. So the function's done all this for us. Now, in the actual M code, for the wrapped up function, we need to make sure that as we go through this dimension by dimension, we're collecting those keys that we were just generating for the product ID. We need to do that for all the other dimensions as we go. So that's why in this logic here, that represents the logic we just went through. We need to make sure that we recursively go through and apply that function so that we can collect the keys as we go. So this is where we've just got a loop counter. Um, we're applying one of the inner functions to um, expand out the dimensions, um, which is just going through, you know, where we where we did that just now for the product dimension. That's just applying this function expand dimension logic. But then we need to apply that multiple times for each of our dimensions. So that's what this loop does, where it just says, um, if we haven't reached the end of our loop, um, then, then, or if we have reached the end of our loop, then stop. Otherwise, apply the same function, the next one down. Um, and then that's how we can build out our flat table. So or our, our uh, flat table with all the keys. So finally, once we've got that logic built in, we need to actually apply this so that we can have our star schema ready for us. So. Um, the final bit of logic, what we would do to wrap all this up is we'd start with, again, our flat table. We'd bring in the schema as well, uh, um, the schema table we've defined. And then we would need to, first of all, group these up into our fact table, um, our fact table and our dimensions here, so as we've got here. So we've got these nested um, column names for each of these here. So you can see we've grouped up the previous step to pull out um, the sales key, unit cost, unit price for the sales fact table. And this is because we need these column names to feed um, into our later steps. Um, so for our dimension list, we need to store a list of these because this is what we're going to loop over in the next uh, the next step, the next few steps. Um, here, we've just defined in this query that exact logic that we just went through previously. And this also go through the looping there. 
And now we're going to apply that looping function where we're just ingesting our flat table and our schema, pulling in our list of dimensions, and we're going to define the, the looping, the number of loops we need to take as just the count of the number of dimensions that we have. Now from here, our flat table, this just has our flat table, but it's gone through and added all of our keys. So it's recursively gone through and applied um, that logic for each dimension. So then the final steps here are around making sure that we identify all the keys that we need to include, because that's going to feed into um, what we're finally going to include as the um, as the columns that we include in the all rows. And then to build out our all rows, which contains each of our entities here, um, whether it's a factor or a dimension, we need slightly different logic. So um, if it's a dimension, what we would need to do is we would need to just select all the attributes, um, select all the attributes from that flat table relating to that particular column. And then we need to take a distinct just to get the distinct values there. Um, we would need to do that um, whether it has a primary key or not. Um, and this line above just says give it a go if there might be a primary key um, that we've created. Otherwise, just do it with what you've got. And that's how we'd create our dimension tables. So that's what we've done, say, with the calendar dimension there, where we've got all the distinct dates there. Um, for the fact, table it's a little simpler we just need to make sure that we're pulling in all the fields that come from the flat table but we're going to filter it down to just the columns that uh, just the columns that relate to the fact table according to the column details here and then we also need to make sure that we're including our keys to use as foreign keys so that's where we've got this previous step to identify those we're going to stitch all those together as our list of columns that we're going to keep and then that's going to form our fact table here and that's all there is to it. So therefore, we've built out all of our facts, our fact table, and our dimension values there as well. So you can see that this particular approach, it's a lot easier than going through manually defining things, a lot more dynamic as well. Um, but um, yeah, I'll admit it's, it's fairly involved as well once you get into the gut. So the good thing is the function's built in a way that it's you know I meant to be used all out of the box there. And I wouldn't expect anyone to necessarily go through um, this demo that I've just taken you through now and expect to understand it straight away. There's um, a lot of a lot to it. So what you can do if you're interested is um, you can have a look at um, you can have a look at uh, the file itself and have a bit of a play. So I'll just bring up as well that we've got um, <clears throat> I've got all the demo files available for you on GitHub oh, as well brilliant. if you want to explore. Um, I'll just paste those into the chat, that link into the chat now. Fabulous, thank you. Can yeah, you just uh, humor me so I can just have a look at the view? And uh, we've got questions coming up, but you just at the view, mm. you know, when you look at the view so that you can see the way the queries flow into each other. But that's brilliant if you can pop the. Mm. Um, oh, was that the, the diagram? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think um, what's happened on my screen? But yeah, the the um the GitHub will would be great. Uh the 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 link to the GitHub here. Yeah, yeah, that would yeah, be perfect. Yeah. And and what yeah. I'll do is I'll put a link to it, to um, into our Devon and Cornwall one as well, so that it can then be reached. Perfect. Yeah, per yeah, perfect. Yeah, I think that's just come through. That's taken a little while yeah. to send. Yeah, I've got it. Good. Yeah, uh, yeah. Can you just humor me before I hand you over to the questions in the chat? It's my meetup mm. group, so I get to ask. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I just see the view? You know, where's the you're in Empower Query? Um, just um, this one here. Yeah, just when you click on the view, you know, add column view, and you um, so right at the top. So next to Home Transform, add column view. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, go yeah, click on view. Oh, query dependencies. There it is. Just query so I can dependencies. See. Yeah. I'll just. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a bit of like between the data source and the 
flat table data plot in CSV. I wouldn't worry too much about that. That's just more um, yeah. staging stuff here. Um, but so um, this is probably not as instructive because a lot of things are all nested up. So you're not necessarily mm. going to see them in the query dependencies view um, around the functions and how they all tie together. But um, talking about query dependencies, one thing that might be more instructive is if we look at at least that manual approach with everything loaded, that I find does tell a bit of a clearer picture around the dependencies. So if I go to query dependencies, Still loading up on my other screen. Mm. Oliver's put Lawn and Torquay and Vic are kind of like Devon and Cornwall, and that had me puzzled for a while, but I'm guessing uh, he's yeah. talking about Australia. Are you Australian, Oliver? Or has he lived in Australia? I'm sure he might have said. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, that's all right. I I I I I've uh, been to Lorna, been to Corte, uh, Torquay, and uh, yeah, that that gives a bit of a good baseline. Yeah, 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 perfect. So say with um say with the manual approach where you can see the dependencies, you've got that sales flat table here. Yeah. You've got all your staging tables that kind of form this like spine along yeah. here, and you've got these almost like ribs of the um the loaded queries there. So this yeah. is kind of like taking that diagram um that that diagram we had in the powerpoint and kind of pivoting it like 45 degrees yeah yeah where it, where it forks them off there so that that's kind of the structure there brilliant right, are you ready for the question sam yeah let's, not let's go for too it. many um basically rahul said he's so glad the session is recorded because he now needs to watch it again at yeah. 0.25 speed i think the last bit so I think he wants to get better M. So I've, I'm going to pop in the chat, um, Rahul. Um, Vavinda does an excellent LinkedIn on Excel, which is just superb for quizzes um, for M. Oliver said, would this work in a snowflake model? Um, so I have tried it for snowflaking. It's not... It we does better, work, yeah. but you you need you need to do a bit of extra work because the tricky thing is making sure the keys are consistent at each layer of that snow that snow yeah. flaking. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's not something that I've gone ahead and tried to build out as yeah. a robust snow flaking thing because also if you wanted to do it all in one step rather than kind of applying that invoked function multiple times you would need to make sure that you've got a clear lineage in this model schema of you know say if you're talking about products product categories subcategories you would need to there would need to be some way to say you know this the the category is based off a product it's not based yeah. off the fact table so yeah. that that's where it does become a bit hairy it's not something that i've um it's not something that i've rushed to really really um yeah. try and design yeah. for and for those of you that don't know, a snowflake is where you have a dimension on top of another dimension. So in, in the first view, Oliver showed where he showed the table, the dimension tables all around the fact table. A snowflake is when you have another dimension on top of another dimension. So it's different layers. I don't know if I've made, explained that visually mm. enough, but you've got, it's like a bit of a hierarchy. Mm. Um, Aurora said, can this M code be used for different flat files like purchases or sales commissions um, by changing the model schema info? So can it be used, mm. you know, on any um, any fact, any flat yeah. table? Yeah, absolutely. So it's built in a generic way that will that will cater to that. Um, so as long as you've got um, as long as you've got things structured as a simple star schema according to to this uh, model schema definition here then it'll work um, it's not built to cover for multiple facts it's not built to cover for snowflaking so um, this is again the limitation of things 
And this is where if you've got if you've got data that is coming through and it conceptually represents multiple facts, that's where taking this kind of out of the box approach isn't really going to have you cover. You need to do things. You'd need to do things bespoke just for that particular yeah. use case. But yes, it will cater to um, it, as long as you can. As long as you can define this model schema with one fact and multiple dimensions in a star schema, it'll it'll work. Yeah. So yeah, um, we've got the GitHub. Uh, Takimi said it was very advanced and um, great to have an automatic way to create the tables. So um, yeah, how did you learn your M code, uh, Sam? Um, well, I mean. It's 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 been a journey for a number of years. Yeah. Um, I would say like there, there's definitely an element of um, practice over time um, yeah. for different projects, but there's also some good books um, that are that are worth going through. I think the um, M is for Data Monkey. Yes, by, chemicals. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, He's so that, genius, that's a good resource. He? Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot of cool stuff in there. Um, um, I think that's the main resource that I think of when I think of Power Query as far as books, but there's also a lot of blogs and other content. I know Melissa DeCourt, mm -hmm. she's really big in that space as well. So she's got yeah. um, some good content online as well. But say even with developing this function, it took me quite a while and a fair bit of coffee to work out conceptually how to exactly build it out. So it wasn't something that took place overnight. Even yeah. getting to the stage of doing recursive functions, I think I'd this was actually more when I was first doing this, this was a bit of a, a project for me to teach myself a little bit about recursive functions. So yeah. um, it's not something that I usually delve into, but um, I get a good project for it. Yeah, it is. And um, uh, Oliver's put in, I'm just getting, just trying to get my book in a minute that I went through. Um, I went through literally chapter by chapter um rahul said how do you get from flat table to model schema table how do you get from flat table to model schema ah table? right yeah good question there is me so, when i just get my book yeah that's all good so the model schema table this isn't actually derived from the flat table in this case this was just something that i had defined in excel and i've just pasted um manually in there so it's not actually derived from the flat table you would have to define that yourself um so just bear that in mind as well yeah the secret source exactly yeah don't know if you can see this one mm. jill revive can you see yeah. it? my camera's not very good jill revive is um absolutely brilliant and it, it you can work through it and he gives you all of the i'll put the um yeah, collect, combine, and transform data using Power Query, Jill Revive. And so if you um, follow him, he's really, really good as well. And he's got you've got all the mm. examples, so you can work through it. So that that's really good. And I can't find, I'm sure it's Behave, Behave who did the, the Power Query thing? Someone else on, on LinkedIn jumped um, in for me. Uh, you know that he does the he does the daily Excel, the daily Power Query mm. quizzes. Which are brilliant. Um, oh, what's his name? I, I thought I thought it was Behuva Gupta, but I can't find the link on on his um, LinkedIn, which shows the link to it. Do you know the one I mean? He does them daily. He does yeah. daily ones. I'll find it think, and I'll pop it. Yeah, I think I've seen them a while back, um, but yeah, I can't recall his name. Yeah. Um, so anyway, there's just lots of lots of chats, lots of very advanced level people. Very very grateful that it's recorded. So um, I'll stop recording now. But a huge thank you, Sam, for your time. Um, and I'll I'll stop recording and then we'll finish off properly. But thank you. Yeah, of course. Right, so glad to uh, glad, glad to share.